so without further ado, before we get to Jill, I would first like to introduce one of our longtime uh, fantastic talc tour directors, Gina Pillsbury, who has worked with us for over 20 years, believe it or not, and runs many of our tours in France and has a really special relationship with Jill. So Gina's going to say just a little bit about Jill and then we will get to the main event. So Gina, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Dustin, and uh, hello, everybody, and uh, bonjour from Paris, France, and uh, as Dustin said, uh, I have a special relationship with Jill, and like Jill, I am American-born, and I'm living in France, and moved over here 20 years ago, and and continuing that journey here, and I am um, been running our tours in southern France since 1998. It's been a special season for me. And it's great to be here with you all today, and especially Jill, and to be able to spend some time with her and you all and make that connection. And I met Jill about six years ago when I began to run our Provence, uh, a week land tour uh, in Provence. She's definitely a highlight on that tour, if not the highlight when she is available. And you will soon understand why. And uh, when we travel through the south of France, we obviously travel through areas that artists have been migrating to for years to explore the, the, the colors, the scenery, the lights. And uh, we try and understand these artists by traveling to their towns and their museums, their villages, their homes, their studios. And it's not always easy and art can be complex and art is personal. The colors, the story, the canvas, the, the brush strokes, all of it is poetry in its own way. And Jill, she is a masterpiece at explaining the choreography that happens between the painter and getting that feeling inside to the canvas, especially when it comes to Vincent van Gogh. So for meeting Jill and having an, an experience with her on one of our tours, when she is available, because she is a professional full-time artist, and uh, she is not always available, but she, when she is, she shows up with a little bit of paint in her hair, and um, she invites us with great energy to her house. And before you get to her house where we're going to visit her studio that her husband built, a studio that is just like that of Paul Cezanne, specifically for her to be uh, inspired and uh, continue to do the journey she has done and began 40 years ago in France. Um, before you even get to Jill's house, she already enlightens all your senses when you travel the road with her. And she talks about the, the wild asparagus growing on the side of the road that she picks and puts in her omelet. She talks about the fields where she rides her horses, her wild irises that grow up the stones to her house, the yard that is spotted with many sculptures from her husband and her sons, because her entire family is artistic. And every sculpture has a story. She tells you about her olive tree that she so happily climbs and picks the olives and presses and makes olive oil or her almond tree where she'll share an almond with you. And then of course that is the first one to bloom in the year and it's definitely one of her muses. And her energy is just incredible. And the inspiration that she gathers from all the senses, there is not one left object that is empty when you're in Jill's sight. She feels and sees everything and you can't help but feel the same thing when you're around her. So I'm really excited to share this moment with you and introduce you to a lady that I completely admire. She's contagious to be around. She's inspirational and she's a, a walking encyclopedia on Mr. Vincent Van Gogh. And uh, I will leave it at that and uh, welcome to the screen, Jill. Take it away. Thank you, Gina and Dustin and Talc Tour. Um, I feel humbled um, to even start um, after all, all these wonderful words. Um, but with, here we are, and I must, um, with 40 years now in Aix-en-Provence, where two thirds of my life has been spent far away from America. I have really enjoyed these past five years where Talc has brought their guests to my house. And I feel like America comes to visit me every Monday during the summer season. 
as I talk today, you'll probably pick up that I do have a Southern accent that in spite of being away for 40 years, um, I have not lost one iota of my Georgia accent. And in fact, this morning when I went to buy the bread at the boulangerie, um, I had my mask on for the coronavirus protection and um, a woman came up to me after I had ordered and said, oh, Sheila, it's you. I didn't recognize you with your mask, but I recognized your accent. So with my 40 years here, I still sound like I arrived in Aix-en-Provence yesterday with my strong American accent. So I'm very proud to be known as the American on the hillside, um, painting and riding her horse across the top of the hill in the olive trees. Today, I want to honor Vincent van Gogh. And it happens to be the day after the 130th anniversary of his death. July 29th, he died 130 years ago. And I would like to share, come to, an, to understand about Vincent and how he has unlocked many mysteries and truths in my own life. I would like for you to understand Vincent in a new way, in a different way, and be open to maybe hearing some things that you have never heard about him before. So many of us have these preconceived notions about him. Before I came to France and I was in my art history class in college, we learned about all the artists. And when they came to Van Gogh, the thing that was said was he was the one that was mad and cut off his ear. Today, I often receive comments that my work shows the influence of Vincent Van Gogh when I'm on tour, which makes me happy. But it's often followed by the joke, oh, let me see your ear, to which I can't help but cringe a little bit because it strikes me again and again that this is the misconception that most people still have about him today. In the entire history of artists since the prehistoric cave paintings of the Lascaux Caves, we know more about Vincent van Gogh than any other artist because of what he wrote by his own hand. How people have gotten it so mixed up, I don't know. How is it that he has been reduced to the one that cut off his ear, the one that went mad? That was such a small incident in his life. It is so unfortunate that his true identity is so misunderstood. From what I see, rather than madman, his true identity should be the man with the most compassion. He wrote these three volumes, 600 pages each, 1,800 typewritten pages in small print of letters to his brother. It's monumental and we know so much if we want to find out about him, let's find out about him from himself. I would like to share with you what I have learned about Vincent. The key events and turning points in his life that made him who he was and how that shaped my own. There are still parts of his life that remain a mystery to all of us, but I would like to shed light on some of the parts of that mystery today. As Richard Rohr, the great Christian philosopher and thinker wrote, remember, mystery isn't something that you cannot understand. It is something that you can endlessly understand. There is no point at which you can say, I've got it. Always and forever, mystery gets you. When I was eight years old, my mother took her life at the age of 34 in Atlanta, Georgia. It was 1967. 
The eternal question that I ask myself is, how could my beautiful, vibrant, fun-loving, caring mother, who was so enthusiastic about life, leave us so abruptly and without warning? Van Gogh's art and writings have helped me come to terms with this question, and that is what I hope to share with you today. Before we get started on Van Gogh, I would like to show you a clip from the recently released documentary, Painting the Invisible, a feature length film made by my son, James Rufato, that shows what drew me to France, my creative process and my relationship with nature. The mountain is a subject in itself that has great meaning from way, way back in my life. So the mountain is like a soulmate. Growing up in Atlanta, Georgia, after the death of my mother, my father sent me to summer camp on Lookout Mountain at Camp DeSoto so that my sisters and I could get to know her by doing the things that she had done. At camp, I experienced nature coming forward to soothe my grieving heart. And this is where I realized there's another world besides this material world that we live in. There's a whole another world out there that is a spiritual world. And I felt it, and I lived it, and I tasted it. And from that point on, the mountain took on great meaning because it reminded me of my spiritual side and it reminded me of my mother. The last summer that I was at camp, at the last spiritual retreat, when I was so sad to leave such a place, the counselor in our group said to us, just take the mountain with you. So I did. And whenever I went back to Atlanta, I missed the mountain. For my 16th birthday, I came home from school and my father held out his gift and it was a book of Paul Cezanne's paintings. And we looked at the book together in front of the fireplace and as we turned the pages, I discovered the mountain that this painter painted, page after page. As I turned the pages, the mountain spoke to me. I went back to school, and it, I kept thinking of those mountain paintings. And I thought, the mountain I have in my heart is similar to the mountain in this book. The strength, the majesty, the mystery, the comfort and hope that comes from the mountain this artist understood exactly the same way that I understood what the mountain could give. After graduation from my studio art degree at Sweetbriar College in Virginia, my father came forward with his gift of a plane ticket to go to Aix-en-Provence to the south of France to go to a painting school in the summer of 1980, where I would be there in the very footsteps of Paul Cezanne, and I would be there in front of the Mount Saint Victoire. first saw the mountain with the Marshutes group of painters. It seemed that it was a poignant moment in my journey. And we climbed the mountain, painted the mountain, and it became a part of my life in a big way from the very start of my arrival in Aix-en-Provence.
As destiny would have it, Cezanne brought me to France in order that I would discover the truth about Vincent van Gogh. Little did I know that was the reason to come when I joined the art program in Aix-en-Provence the summer of 1980. One of my professors began a class with reading a letter by Vincent van Gogh. I was immediately drawn in. Some, so much of his story, his way of conveying his emotions, his sensations, his beliefs and desires, his way of experiencing the world around him reminded me of myself. I felt truly that I had found a kindred spirit. More than anything, <clears throat> Vincent's letters got me thinking about my own identity. Growing up, being a child without a mother was who I was. That was my identity. I didn't question it, I just accepted it. When I arrived in France, I was no longer a child. I was in my 20s and grappling with who I was. My identity as I headed into adulthood. I had so many questions. What was I supposed to do with my life? Was I supposed to go back to Atlanta? So much was coming together here in X. I had met a French guy. I loved life in X, the market, the walking everywhere, the church I went to in the mornings for Les Lodes. Could I be an artist? Could I be a full-time artist? How would I live? What about my mood swings? where I would feel exhilarated by my life one day, thinking how lucky I am to be here, and then seized with self-doubt the next. Were these mood swings a possible sign of depression? Is it hereditary? Was I someone who could be suicidal like my mother? Is it going to come that way for me? At times, it felt like I was in a desert. I had so many questions and so few answers. I was a foreigner, unknown. I was nobody in X. But I found great comfort in realizing that Van Gogh also thought of himself as a nobody. And he was a nobody in Arl. He was a stranger in Arl. He was viewed as a stranger the entire time that he was in Arles. He wrote to Theo and he said, what am I in the eyes of most people? A non-entity, an eccentric, or an unpleasant person. Someone who has no position in society and never will have. In short, the lowest of the low. All right then, if that were absolutely true, then I should one day like to show by my work what such an eccentric, such a nobody has in his heart. That is my ambition, based less on resentment than on love. In spite of everything, based more on a feeling of serenity than on passion. Though I am often in the depths of mis misery, there is still calmness, pure harmony, and music inside me. Those words were of great solace for me. Theo's wife, Joe, also said, once he had found his calling, he no longer doubted himself. No matter how difficult or hard his life became, there was an inner serenity and conviction that he was doing what he was meant to do. This inner serenity, this pure harmony and music inside was exactly, exactly what I was seeking for myself. 
Van Gogh had found it through his paintings and drawing, the act of creating. And I realized that I also found the same solace when I was working. So I worked and I worked and I worked. The search for inner peace led me to develop a work, a working habit, which felt like an anchor and a stability and gave me fulfillment. The way he lived his life as an artist gave me a framework for how I could live my own. When I read Vincent's letters, I immediately noticed his kinship with nature. I was brought up completely surrounded by nature, much more than other children. My father had four little girls and he just put us outside in the morning and we were out all day long. He took us fox hunting every weekend and he sent us to summer camp on Lookout Mountain. We lived in the woods. We lived in the ocean and swam in the water and swam in the lakes and dug our own worms up to fish in the lakes. Summer after summer, I went to camp and I thrived on nature. Once I arrived in France, my art school taught me to follow Van Gogh's way of painting in nature. My art degree had been such that we painted abstract paintings. We were never taken outside to paint what we saw, smelled, tasted, heard, felt. Painting outdoors on plein air enabled me to go beyond myself and get lost in the moment, which caused me to shed any feelings of doubt, depression, loneliness, or rejection. It would allow me to enter a timeless spiritual state that made me feel a maternal presence in the earth and reminded me of my roots. I had found my raison d'etre and it felt right. I devoted myself to it entirely. Van Gogh gave me the courage to pursue the life of an artist, an artist's life full time. Painting became, as Flannery O'Connor would put it, my habit of being. I was able to live through my art and start a family with that French guy that I had met my second day in France. And here I am today, 40 years later, still on the same path, endlessly understanding the mystery. When I am out painting, the mystery is what I am after. Nature always has a mystery to reveal. Painting in nature is not about creating realistic copies of what we see. Rather, it is about receiving the gift of nature and passing it on to the viewer. It is about expressing an unseen beauty. It hasn't been seen yet and the artist goes out to express the unseen beauty. It is painting the invisible. The invisible that Van Gogh was trying to paint was that he wanted to paint paintings that give comfort and hope to those who suffer the way music does. He found great comfort in going out at night to look at the stars. He wrote, when I am depressed, Theo, I go out at night and look at the stars and the stars give me hope. The stars give us hope when all sounds cease. God's voice is heard under the stars. As we all know, this led to his most famous painting of Starry Night. The painting here is the one he did in Arles on the border of the Rhone River. And of course he put the sweet couple down in the bottom. 
as what he yearned was to have a relationship with someone who would love him and who he could love. At the time of painting Starry Night, he had been experiencing, well, first of all, he was in Arles, and then he painted the Starry Night in Arles, and he lived in his wonderful little yellow house that we can still see the place where it used to be before it was bombed in the war, but everything about this painting is still there except for the little yellow house. Um, it's a right on the edge of the Rhone River. At the time of painting Starry Night, he had been experiencing symptoms of what we know today as temporal lobe epilepsy, TLE. This malady is characterized by episodes in which a person goes into a sleepwalking state in the state of TLE, you act out your dreams. While he was living in Arles, he went to the bullfights. He saw the matador give the bull's ear to the honored lady. As a pacifist, the gruesome barbarity was extremely disturbing to him. Also at the time, he was seeing a prostitute and he fell in love with her. In an epileptic crisis, Vincent decided that he needed to show her how dearly he loved her. He would even give his own flesh and blood, as Christ did, and as the bull did, and as it must have been part of his dream, experiencing the epileptic crisis of temporal lobe epilepsy. It was in a little box that, and it was taken to her. And of course, she was one of the first ones that said, he is a madman. After this episode, his reputation as being mad stuck with him and remains to this day. But the truth is that between his crisis, crises, he was sane. The doctor who had cared for him, Dr. Ray suggested I think you might be happier in Saint Remy at the asylum where my, where my mentor is, who did his doctorate on epilepsy. He could help you because I think you have the malady of epilepsy. He said, on top of that, you will have three meals a day and you will be safe. And there is a beautiful church there where you can meditate and pray and you can paint. So following Dr. Ray's advice, Vincent went to the asylum, which was on the grounds of a monastery, Saint Paul de, Vin Saint -Paul de Mosul. It was there that he painted his most famous starry night painting. My husband is from Tarascon, which is the town just next to Saint Remy, and we go there often. But a couple of years ago, my husband and I went to Saint Remy, which is the town Saint Paul de Mosul, the asylum is in. And as we hiked up the hill above the asylum, I was thrilled to find a view of the very church painted in Starry Night. I started thinking about how he managed to paint such a powerful painting with such simple and undramatic with such a simple and undramatic subject. Looking at this image of what I saw, it's not too far from what he was seeing himself and that there's not a lot there for such a famous painting. There must have been something within him that ignited the idea of the starry night from seeing this view. Unfortunately, this is one of the few paintings in which we have very little writing by Vincent van Gogh's hand, thus keeping the mystery alive and allowing us to endlessly understand it. As I look at it, I was reminded of his writings on the butterfly. This drawing is where he's much more loyal to what he sees. 
He's painting, he's drawing the church and the village and how everything relates, the olive trees, and getting it on paper how, how he sees it um, as he looks on present on the hillside. He takes this, this um, idea, this, he takes this and, ta and allows his own inner poetry to dominate, to come forward, to come into the starry night that we know, that we all know. As I thought about the butterfly, he and his writings, he wrote about how we humans trudge across the ground. We toil and we labor and we put one foot in front of the other and we serve humanity like a caterpillar. He wanted to give us the hope and comfort that one day one would be freed from the life of the caterpillar to become a butterfly. And in this painting of Starry Night, the cypress tree is a sign of welcome to the afterlife. And the steeple is penetrating into the heavens. Both traverse the horizon line. If you observe the olive trees as they go back into the distance all the way to the horizon line, it seems as if they are caterpillars trudging, trudging across the earth and laboring. Even as you look, it seems the way he did the brushstrokes, there seems to be movement on this static two-dimensional canvas. He's given us the illusion of movement as if they are caterpillars trudging into the distance. You reach the threshold and the cypress tree welcomes you into the heavens where you are freed and transformed like a butterfly among the stars. Both Vincent van Gogh and my mother trudged like caterpillars until they reached their horizon and passed through to a new beginning. Many times I have heard people say, what a waste, referring to the death of my mother. I never really re agreed with this statement or it, it's not how I saw it. Her death was not wasted. It shaped my identity. It made me who I am today and it gave me a reason to live. It has made me more compassionate than if I had not had such a tragedy in my life. I've come to terms with the mystery of the unknown. When I look at Starry Night, I see it as illustrating a path to the heavens. I see in Vincent van Gogh's letters and in certain aspects of my mother's life that their door to life started to close and the only logic they had was the door to death was opening to them. Even though he was painting these beautiful paintings and she, my mother, was living this fulfilling life with four daughters, their loneliness and despair were enough to make death seem to be the only way towards peace and freedom. On January 7th, 1998, my father took his life. Once again, during this difficult time, Van Gogh's letters and art soothed me and helped me find my way. 10 months after my father's death, in the depths of my grief, I was standing before Van Gogh's sewer at the Musée d'Orsay doing a drawing of it. The message, behold, the sower went forth to sow, spoke straight to my heart, even though it was in the dead of winter where you can see his color and brushstrokes show you that there is nothing growing and the colors of, are of the soil in the winter, the winter time look. During that austere time of year, which was also an austere, somber time of my own life, the sower went on faith, hoping that his labor 
would bear fruit. I see this painting as a self-portrait of Van Gogh. He became the sower. Each seed was like a painting falling from his hand to the earth in the wintertime when no one took notice, when he was rejected by all. His hope and belief were that one day they would be harvested, that his message of hope and comfort would be felt by someone. And 110 years later, I stood before this painting drawing from it. And when I looped the drawing stroke around the back of the sower's head to represent the sun rising from the earth, goosebumps stood up on my skin as I realized the deep message that Van Gogh was really revealing to me at the very moment when I needed it the most. The sun is also meant to be a halo. Saying that if you can go on faith and take courage and continue to sow seeds, springtime will come. And those seeds will grow in the summer and they will be harvested. Art can heal, not just in creating it, but also in viewing it. Art exists to make us taste the eternal. May my soul touch your soul, and may you be taken beyond your daily struggles and be given a taste of the eternal. Merci. Thank you for listening to my talk. If you want to watch my son's full documentary of 55 minutes and read my, or read my book with my own poetry, prose, and autobiographical writings and a 30-year retrospective of my work or have information about my tours and other events, you can subscribe to my newsletter on my website, which is www dot art in Provence dot com or Jules dot com. There are two ways to go. Thank you so much. And thank you Talc Tour for letting this happen. It's been a, a great, a great experience for me to prepare this for you. And um, I hope we'll have some questions. Thank you so much, Jill. We appreciate you taking us through that. That was fantastic. Yes, we do have a bunch of questions coming through. So I will start rattling them off to you, if you don't mind, in our last 15 minutes or so here. There's a lot that's come through both uh, before you started and during about uh, Van Gogh's death and whether or not it was a suicide or a murder or, um, or what it actually was. So many are interested in your thoughts and opinions about that, if you wouldn't mind sharing. Okay, um, I have, like I said, it's the best place to go is volume three of his own letters and read all the letters in all the volumes up to volume three. And when you get to those final letters, it's, it's um, for me, it's a journey into that door of life seeming to close. And this thing that happens where the door to death opens as a beckon and these blocks that build up the block of total rejection. He put his heart, mind, soul, and every hour of the day into his paintings. And I feel that he knew what he was doing was genius. Every once in a while, I feel strongly about my painting. And I said, Jill, it's out of the box. You allowed grace to happen. Something happened greater than what I could do myself. And I feel that he extraordinarily was able to paint 150 masterpieces the last 150 days of his life. But the rejection of that beautiful work that he put everything he had into it and the blocks building up, the rejection, the malady with crises returning from time to time and the loneliness, the dejection, all of the human feelings that began to be one block up, up, up to where it toppled the whole thing over and that door to death began to be the way that he would have the utmost peace and freedom. 
So through his letters and through his art, where he was painting, if you look at the paintings he painted of, at Eternity's Gate, and um, he said, this is the reaper. I'm no longer painting the sower. Here is the reaper, Theo. It is the almost smiling of death, he wrote. Those are his very words. I believe in that, uh, what is it? Endlessly trying to understand mystery. For me, he took his life. I read the article that the New York Times came out about yesterday um, uh, on his anniversary that they found the last place he painted and the writer of the researcher who found that spot said he, he, he was there all day long painting that painting. He couldn't have gone out and gotten drunk like the book says and two boys coming along and shooting him. He, that road, that spot that they found is right evident. It's right there at ta in town. And, and so there are a lot of, I've, I've, I've read so many books um, about lawyers um, defending trial cases and things in novels, Grisham novels and all of this. And you, you can turn things one way or the other, however you want to see it. So it's that eternal, eternally trying to understand the mystery. And for me, it points to um, it being a suicide and the Van Gogh um, Museum in Amsterdam still abides by that theory. Thank you, Jill. Um, a couple more coming through here. There's a lot of interest in pivoting just a, a little bit um, about more of painting in general. There's a lot of interest about light and light specifically in the X area. Um, mm -hmm. And there's some questions about why a lot of Impressionist painters paint there. Um, and is the light different in different parts of France or just getting your take on how the light um, in the location affects the painting? Okay, well, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia where it rains and rains and rains and we have beautiful um, oak trees that are just fabulous and lush earth. Well here, it's the wind and the, we have 33 winds and they all have names. But the most famous one is Le Mistral the Mistral wind that comes, funnels down the Rhone River and brings the coolness down from the mountains. And it, in Provence, it's called Le Medicament de Provence, the medicine of Provence, because it blows away all the pollution. And it creates this incredible translucent light. It also brings nature together. It harmonizes nature because everything's blowing. So your breaststroke is blowing. Your heart is blowing, the elements in your soul are blowing, everything comes together and you begin to enter the dance of nature through the light and through the wind. The wind clears it all up and you can see shadows and lights and shiny things and it's an incredible experience to be here and see this extraordinary light. Thank you, Jill. Um, another one here about specifically about painting more. Can you speak to the colors that Van Gogh typically used? Um, do you think, and do you think that was consistent with his personality? Yes. Um, in fact, um, in my workshops that I teach here in France, um, um, I teach the mixing of the palette and I teach mixing the Van Gogh palette and the Cezanne palette. And um, I have read all of his letters and his list of paints that he wanted his brother to send him down from Paris. So I've, I buy, I still use all of those colors myself. And I have done a in-depth study of Cezanne's, of Van Gogh's choice of colors. And he, so the Impressionist um, deleted black from their palettes and so did Van Gogh. And, but they could still get a very dark, dark, um, almost black. But when you look out in nature, all of the darks do have a color. They tend toward a dark green or toward a dark purple or whatever. And so you, you mix the colors together. But Van Gogh, clearly he was interested in that very strong dialogue between the warmest of the warms and the coolest of the cools of two complementary colors. For example, blue to orange. Behind Dustin's head, um, in when you can see Dustin speak, look at the irises and you can see the orange 
and the blue having a dance together. Um, yin, yang, a warm answered by a cool and a, and a light answered by a dark. And so his colors were um, bold, but he always put a slight little bit of the complementary color into the color that he was using so that they would be harmonious, meaning a, just a smidgen of blue into the orange, a smidgen of orange into the blue, a smidgen of red into the green, a smidgen of red of green into the red, and into the yellow he put purple, and into the purple he put yellow. Even on that sewer painting where you see that beautiful orange sun creating a halo behind the sewer's head, if you did a copy of that painting, which I would encourage you to do because it would be a wonderful exercise, you will have to put a little bit of purple in that yellow for it to be like Van Gogh's yellow. I hope that answers. I could speak about the color for the next four hours. So. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you could, but I'll move aside here so people can see that painting for a couple seconds, but yes. Do you Thank see you, how sure the reds of the ground, the reds in the ground tones are next to the greens um, in the um, reeds of the, in the stems of the irises? And then you have the blues of the irises that are being answered by the orange um, uh, marigolds in the back. Unfortunately, they can't see that unless I'm speaking. So I, we can't speak <laughs> over each other. So they can look, they can look now or they can maybe look up that painting. Um, another one here, this is just about painting in general, which is, I think is interesting. Do all of your paintings have some sort of symbolic meaning or is sometimes a painting just a painting? That's a question that I might need to think about, but I, I begin my painting. I'm very, I would say that Cezanne is my remote grandfather, austere grandfather and says, and Van Gogh is my soulmate. And I learned many things from Cezanne. And he said, one of the things he said is to empty yourself of everything, no preconceived notions, nothing, and receive nature through the senses. Smell, taste, feel, make yourself aware of what nature is giving you, and then you start. And the first 20 brushstrokes should be all over the canvas. He said, if I catch myself thinking, patatras, Je fous le toile par terre. If I catch myself thinking, I throw the canvas on the ground and start over. So the purpose is to go beyond the intellect and allow something greater than yourself to happen by receiving nature through the senses. So I cannot say that every painting has a deeper spiritual method, uh, message, but it does have the spirit in it and it is a dance. I am dancing with nature. And I hope that with my own poetic reaction to what I'm painting, that my viewer will then take it and have their own poetic reaction to my painting. And then we have a three-way dance. That's a, that's a great answer there. I love that, <laughs> I love that metaphor. Um, another question here, we have just about five minutes left. We'll hopefully get to a few more is about uh, Van Gogh's estate and who has uh, control over it now. I believe there was some um, control uh, back and forth early on, but or do you know who has control over Van Gogh's estate currently? I do not know who has control over it currently. I would imagine it would be the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam um, that was given to them by Vincent's namesake, Vincent. The beauty of what happened after Van Gogh's death is extraordinary. And anyone who's interested in Van Gogh should read um, about Joe Bonger, Theo's wife, his brand new wife, who came in and he, she, had, she was pregnant and had this little baby and they named the baby Vincent. And then six months later, when the baby was six months old, Vincent Van Gogh, the uncle died. And six months after that, the father, Theo, died. He, it says in, Vince, in Joe's biography that he died of heartbreak. Um, but anyway, the baby grew up with the mother. The mother gathered up all of his artwork, the hundreds of thousands of paintings in Paris, 
and took them back to Holland where she was, where she was from and lived in a garage, I mean, in an attic, rented in an attic and raised her child and started translating the hundreds of letters and started having shows and her métier had been English translation. So she translated all the letters into English and she had this huge correspondence and she worked the rest of her life to get Vincent known. And it, it, she could have thrown, oh, the first thing she did is she went to the lawyers with the Van Gogh found, uh, family and asked them to sign this paper that every single letter and painting in her possession belonged to her son. That was the first monumental thing that she did. So with that huge body of work, she was able to work with it. And that's why we have Vincent now. Great. Along those same lines, actually, um, a guest is wondering what your explanation would be as to why Van Gogh only sold um, one painting during his life, given his brother's um, relationship with respected art dealers. Was it, was it the art itself that was rejected? It's that rejection that hurt him so deeply because <clears throat> he knew what he was doing was strong. He felt it deeply, but no one else could see it. Everyone was blind to the beauty of the painting. It takes time sometimes. Uh, so many artists in the whole history of art, when you look, so many were rejected at the time. All of the famous painters of the time, Maisonnier and La Fontaine Latour, and all of these painters that were, people were paying lots of money for in Paris, no one hears about them. And the museums don't know what to do with their work because they're down in the basement and they're just taking up space. It's the ones that got out of the bucks, that did something new, that discovered the unknown, that went out on the edge and painted the unknown. It, it took a while for the public to see it and understand it and embrace it. Thank you. Um, another one here about um, any commentary you might have on Leonard Nimoy's uh, Vincent. Is that the film? I'm sorry. Yeah, the I'm film. Yep. yep. Um, I think I have to pass on that because I, 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 I'm, I'm confused which film it is. Is it the one with the paintings that you walk into the painting or is that I'm not sure that There's the guest just said Vincent, so I'm not, I'm not positive. But she's, uh, this guest was assuming you had seen the film. I've seen the, I've seen the recent two, one at Eternity's Gate, and it's not, and then the other one is of the paintbrush strokes. Uh, you know, you're, while, you're in the painting itself, and I loved that movie. I um, was actually invited to be, to be one of the participating artists to be in uh, creating the movie. Um, nine years ago, and the jury would have either taken me in or not, but I was too afraid, having three sons of my own, and I live uniquely on the income of my art, um, I was afraid to take that leap and be stuck in a, music, in a movie set, creating paintings um, and not being sure of the income, so I had to pass. Got it. Well, that's interesting. I mean, that's pretty cool that you were, you were asked, at least. Yeah. Um, okay, let's, let's maybe get to one more. Um, where can guests see Van Gogh's um, art, um, you know, throughout museums around the world, if you have you know, maybe a list? Um, of the real painting? Yeah. There are a lot at the Hermitage, but the most powerful, amazing experience to experience Van Gogh is the museum in Amsterdam, the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. It is, I went there on my honeymoon with my French husband who I met my second day here. I, I just said, we have to go there. So I don't, I hope that he knew how much I loved him, but I think he might've had a few doubts that really Van Gogh was the one <laughs> that I was marrying. <laughs> but it's fabulous. <laughs> Great. Well, we are just at our hour time limit. Thank you so much, Jill, for your talk today, for answering our questions. I know there were a lot of questions that we didn't get to, so I will, I will Send them to me these. and I'll be happy to answer. I'll be Great. happy so to I'll answer. Com I'll them. compile these for Jill and get some answers and then we'll, we'll, we'll look to send a follow-up out to all, everyone who registered for the 
for the presentation today so that we can answer those questions for you. Um, again, thank you, Jill. Thank you, everyone who joined. We really appreciate your time and your interest. Um, Jill, is there anything else you'd like to say before we close? Thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. This, this was recorded and it will be edited and sent out probably within a week or so. So look out for that in another um, Compass newsletter um, notification. And we'll get those questions answered by Jill um, sometime soon as well and get those back out to you. Thank you, everyone. Hope you have a great day or evening wherever you are.